All right, so um, you can sit back and uh, relax for the first half hour of the class because we're going to have a, I'm going to give a running commentary. Let me tell you what we're going to be doing uh, for the first uh, 45 minutes approximately. So uh, this is a uh, slideshow. This is uh, drawn from a collection that I have of, uh, you know, something like 15,000 images uh, of Gandhi, about 6,000 distinct images. I've been working on a book for about 10 years on global representations of Gandhi in cartoons, uh, uh, nationalist prints, uh, sculpture, statues, painting, uh, drawn from all parts of the world. Um, from about, uh, you know, the early 1900s when Gandhi first began to be known in South Africa uh, down to the present. So what you're seeing here is obviously a, a, a just an extraordinarily brief uh, sample of that. Uh, but there is an argument. This is not simply randomly drawn. Uh, and I'm going to therefore give a running commentary, uh, a very, uh, you know, f a brief uh, and rather rapid uh, commentary, just so that you get some sense of how one might possibly interpret these images and locate them. Uh, now, there's no question, as you'll see, that Gandhi was an extraordinarily, extraordinarily globalized figure. Uh, and in fact, I think I would go so far as to say that there is no one since the time of the Buddha uh, so that takes us back to uh, 2,500 years, uh, who really became as universalized among Indian figures as did Gandhi. Uh, so, uh, uh, and and you know, some of the some of the things that you see here, there, uh, there uh, are uh, come from you know uh, these these images come from as I've said, a diverse array of sources. Let me just uh, also draw your attention to a number of things which are critical if you're interested in, in, in the visual image and how one would interpret the visual image. Uh, so you know the materiality of it makes a difference. Uh, this for example is a nationalist print. And when I say nationalist print, what, what do I mean? I mean something that was actually uh, something on the size of let's say uh, you know one and a half by two feet. All right, uh, we don't know how many copies were printed, maybe 10,000, maybe 20,000. Uh, sometimes we know something about the printer. Uh, we don't really know anything about, uh, about uh, you know, who, who's responsible for most of these kinds of uh, images. So they're called nationalist prints. Um, and these are on paper. Uh, the, uh, the likelihood is that they were actually uh, used, uh, you know, put up on walls, uh, just like people might put up images of gods and goddesses, right? Uh, so this is, this is a very early nationalist print, uh, one of the earliest, and you see here uh, elements of, uh, so that's the second thing, the iconography. It, uh, when I say iconography, uh, what I mean is that you can identify Gandhi usually by a number of elements, much in the way in which you can recognize Christian saints. For those of you who have a knowledge of Christianity and how saints are represented, so how do you recognize, let's say, Saint Sebastian? You know, there are hundreds of saints. Uh, how do you know that that's Saint Sebastian? Because when you look at medieval paintings, European paintings, uh, you know, they're not going to write underneath that. They're not going to give you a caption and say that this is Saint Sebastian. Well, if you see a young, handsome looking saint with spears through his chest, that's Saint Sebastian. If you see a saint and there's a lion seated next to him, that's Saint Jerome, right? That's the iconography of a saint. And Gandhi, I'm going to suggest to you, is the only figure from Indian history who is not the founder of a religion such as let's say the Buddha, okay, around whom there is a very, very distinct iconography. We'll see in rapid succession elements of that iconography. That iconography could include the cap, that's called the Gandhi cap. So he's there right in the middle, you know, spinning. Uh, he's sitting on top of the globe. Uh, this is uh, what you see there is not the flag of India, independent India, it's the flag of the Congress. Right, and on top of that is uh, Tilak, someone whom I mentioned an Indian nationalist who by this time had really passed away. Uh, so this is, uh, and, and what you see here is you know, a woman spinning on the left, so you're beginning to see elements of the nationalist imaginary. And then within that we're going to see that Gandhi has a very distinct iconography. This image, uh, for example, it's a very rare image. Uh, uh, as I, I, it's never been published by a scholar, uh, so this is actually from a, uh, from a, 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 Euro a European uh, magazine, uh, and it shows Gandhi in the ring, 
uh, with a much heavier boxer whom he's, he's brought down to the floor. And you know that that boxer represents Great Britain because you see the flag of the, the Union Jack wrapped around uh, the, the boxer. So there are lots of cartoons. Here's another nationalist print, right? Uh, but I'll explain to you, uh, here I'm just doing it, I'm just giving you a little diversity just so that you get some sense of uh, what kind of representations one can really expect in a way. This is again part of the nationalist construction of India, Bharat Mata, that's Mother India, and here you have Gandhi sitting in the lap of Mother India, the flag at the back there, instead of Tilak, now you see Krishna, the Indian god, right? And you see Gandhi seated in the lap of Mother India, he's got the spinning wheel there, and she has uh, she's taken him to her bosom, right? Uh, th this is the mother embracing the child as it were. Uh, so and this, this here, it tells you 1948, it gives you the approximate size you know, of, of the print, 18 inches by 24 inches. Uh, here's another one. So these are what are called nationalist prints. These are the things that have been studied more than anything else. Right? If, if you're looking at you know, the huge iconography of Gandhi, the only thing that has really received attention are these nationalist prints, not something like this. This cartoon, cartoons like this have never really been studied. So here's a, th a third point I'm saying that even within the set of visual representations, there are some things that have been studied more than others, and certainly the nationalist prints have been studied more extensively. This is in black and white. Uh, the caption on the top says, Bharat Mata ki God mein Mahatma Gandhi. So in the lap of Mother India is Mohandas Gandhi, Mahatma Gandhi. Right? He's already, of course, the Mahatma. Uh, this is the Prabhu Dayal. That's the workshop uh, and probably the artist as well. Um, but again, you don't see that in many of them. Uh, okay, so these are what are called nationalist prints. Uh, we won't have time to go through all of them. I, I want to show you this one here because this is extraordinarily uh, interesting, worthy of a lecture unto itself, just this particular, particular print here. Uh, so you see Mother India uh, there personified as a goddess, right, uh, with the flag in the background. And then you see Gandhi on the top. Now notice on the left, Jesus Christ, on the right, the Buddha, right? So the printmaker, you know, this is not the scholar speaking. The printmaker, whoever put it together, in their mind, Gandhi was already being assimilated to the ranks of the great religious teachers and founders of humanity, right? But on the other hand, the printmaker also understood that Gandhi is working within the Indian political context. So what do you see here? You see, you see six figures here in addition to Gandhi on the top over there, right? Uh, and each of these played a significant role. Vivekananda is not really, I mean, he's not a politician. In fact, he dies before the beginning uh, of the Gandhian phase of Indian nationalism, several years before that. Um, and then on the left there is Subhash Chandra Bose, uh, a, a figure that I'm going to talk about later on when we're finished with the slideshow. Uh, and I'm not going to try, I'm not going to, uh, you know, uh, spend time identifying everyone there because uh, uh, you don't know most of these uh, people, such as Rajaji, for example. All right. Uh, and here again, a nationalist print. This one had certainly a pedagogic purpose. What do I mean by a pedagogic purpose? Remember, the bulk of the people in India are illiterate at this time. They can't read. So Gandhi is written in Swaraj. Well, they're not reading Hind Swaraj. How are Gandhi's teachings being propagated? One of the ways in which they're being propagated is through these prints. So you, pr you print 20,000 of these, okay? And you pass them out in villages. And w w what is the print telling you? That Gandhi advocates the destruction of palm trees. Why? Because, of course, you get, you get toddy, which is a fermented liquor. Right? And re remember that I've mentioned this on a number of occasions, that part of the constructive program was Gandhi's campaign against alcohol. Right? So this is how you would actually uh, be able to spread the message of uh, Gandhi. Did somebody have a question there? No, okay. All right. So, and these, so, so now, when I say the materiality, the material history, one of the things you have to understand is the prints originate in a certain context. Cartoons originate in another context. A lot of European 
journals, such as this one here, okay, the Kladderdash, this German one, right? He, 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 uh, the, these suggest that Gandhi's image was being circulated globally by the 1920s, 1930s. Right? And these, again, are a set of very rare images that we don't really, here what you see is satire. So here, in fact, Gandhi in this particular cartoon, right, uh, we know that Gandhi is a, is a champion of liquor, but, this, but one of the liberties the cartoonist has is what? The liberty of satire, right? No one is spared by the cartoonist. And certainly you see here that Gandhi is having a bit of a, so this is a, a jar of liquor, uh, and you know, they're, they're having some jolly good fun. Um, now, again, then we'd have to go through the captions and look exactly at what is going on here, but just gives you an illustration. Statues, as you're going to see, have a very different, okay, impression that they leave behind. And we're going to try to understand exactly how one under interprets statues. So, the first thing I want to point out about statues. What are we doing here? At the moment, we're simply looking at what are the different modes, okay, in which Gandhi is represented. That, uh, and here I'm talking about the medium, whether it's print, whether it's film, whether it's cartoons, or as in this case, uh, something made of copper, sometimes wood, right, sometimes lacquer. This is a statue of Gandhi in Tavistock Square in London. And of course, there's a special significance to having a statue of Gandhi in London. In, this, in, in one of the central places in London, and the significance being that, of course, it was Gandhi who brought down. If you accept this reading, you don't have to, some, but brought down the British Empire. Certainly the person who is viewed as a major anti-colonial figure. So to have a statue of him in London uh, has, is, is, of course, pregnant with meaning for these reasons. It's an admission by the empire that, well, here's, here's this man who, in fact, actually uh, uh, help to bring the empire down, right? A, a very serene figure here, uh, draped in the shawl. You can see he's bare-chested. That's part of the iconography, by the way. Usually Gandhi is going to be shown bare-chested, right? Uh, but as I said, a figure of serenity. It could almost be the Buddha, frankly, if you look at statues of the Buddha. Of course, there's differences here, but that's what the... And a very, very finished work, a very fine work by a sculptor called Freda Brilliant, uh, look at this statue, right? This you can see is a much more vernacular, right? It's, it has a more folksy touch. It's not been done in the workshop and been crafted for six months or one year or two years, right? This is in Pushkar, uh, which is a, uh, uh, a place in Western India. It's, it's, it's revered as a sacred site. And you see Gandhi here with a book. Well, the book is not identified, most likely the Bhagavad Gita, uh, one of the Indian scriptures, but it could be obviously another work as well. But I'm saying a much more vernacular kind of, right? Not so finished. Now here's a statue. This is even more vernacular. This is extraordinary, this statue. Absolutely extraordinary because it shows you how the statue maker is assimilating different traditions. Why is it extraordinary? This is found in a place called Nalanda. Okay, Nalanda is a major Buddhist site in India. It used to be a site of a university that flourished for a thousand years before it was destroyed sometime around 1200 approximately, right? Uh, and uh, these robes that you see here, these are Buddhist robes. So what, is it, what has the person done? The statue maker, and if you look at the face again, so you see Gandhi's walking stick, Right? You see the walking stick with which he's very often identified. Right? But what the statue maker has done is he or she has merged the figure of the Buddha into the figure of the Gandhi by taking the Buddhist robes and supplanting them, as it were, onto Gandhi. And of course this is done in a site which is a major site. It, it's, it could be an argument to suggest that, well, Gandhi is viewed as now part of the Buddhist tradition, or it could be interpreted to mean that in fact Gandhi has in some ways appropriated the Buddhist imagery, right? But the idea of course is to in some sense suggest the consonance, the congruency between, between Gandhi and the Buddha, right? Um, now, I also want to suggest something else here. 
okay, that we can think about various kinds of Gandhis. So there is a standing Gandhi. There is the seated Gandhi. If you look at this figure over here, here we are talking about the seated Gandhi. Now you are talking about the standing Gandhi. Here you are talking about the walking Gandhi. And you have heard already about Gandhi's inclination towards walking. Right? He almost made a religion of it, you could argue. It's, uh, but he certainly, certainly, this was not only a way to keep healthy, it was, but if you recall all the arguments in Insuraj, uh, it is an argument for, for trying to understand your body, having a relationship with your body. It's, it's an argument for slowing down, right? uh, an argument against speed, etc., etc. Uh, but why am I showing them in this particular sequence? Because here I am now drawing your attention to another facet of how one might study the visual history of Gandhi. So I'm saying there's the seated Gandhi, the standing Gandhi, the walking Gandhi, as in this case this is an image uh, which was inspired by the salt march. This is by Nandalal Bose, a very famous artist. And here you see again uh, a walking Gandhi. This is by an artist based in South India, very contemporary. Uh, uh, image uh, over here. The, he's, he's done a set of 60 uh, of these very large works on Gandhi uh, in, in charcoal and ink. Uh, and here you see what I call the individuated Gandhi. Let me explain what I mean by the individuated Gandhi. Gandhi is one of the masses and yet he's singular. He's distinct. Right? This is a fundamental fundamental issue always with, with figures like Gandhi. That yes, you know, particularly someone like him who felt not only drawn to the masses, but who claimed to speak for the masses. He is a leader of a mass movement. Right? He's one of them. And yet, of course, we know that he is, in fact, actually singular. Right? And now, what, what are we looking at here? We're also looking at a photograph. Right? And that's a huge archive of photographs of Gandhi. Gandhi was certainly one of the most well photographed people in the world, uh, notwithstanding the fact that the camera was a relatively, relatively speaking, uh, uh, a rare item in India. Uh, its use would have been much, much more prolific, of course, uh, in Britain and the United States and Europe, but there were photographers around, uh, and of course it was understood. Uh, by the uh, by, the uh, second decade of the 20th century, that Gandhi was, if I may use a cliche, making history. So there were obviously people looking to capture him, right, uh, on film in various ways. But if you look at this, it's an extraordinary photograph, right? And of course, you could say that, well, you know, one's reading too much. But uh, into the photograph, if if you if you look at the kind of argument I want to make so here, for example, what you could see is, well, Gandhi is almost in the middle of the frame. His singularity is marked by the fact that he is the only one who's bare chested. Right? And he's surrounded by all these people. He seems to be looking at you, at the viewer. He's also towering over everybody else. That, and of course, partly it has to do with the fact that he's at an elevated platform, whereas the others aren't. Right? But it could also depend on how the, how the photographer took the shot, what was the angle from which he took the shot. Right? But this is what I mean by the individuated Gandhi, that there are 15 figures in this composition, 15, 20 figures in this composition, and Gandhi still actually stands out. And look at this one here, where again, he stands out. So here you've got these people, they're all lined up, right? They've got their hands in, in, in respectful um, greetings to, to Gandhi. He's obviously entered some kind of village. There's an entourage next to him. He's accompanied by these women. He's bare chested. He has a towel over his head, probably extremely hot. Uh, uh, you know, the day that th this particular photograph was taken. Uh, and he's coming into the village. Now, there are many people there. And yet again, it is his singularity that is really striking. This is what I mean when I say the individuated Gandhi. And this is an extraordinary illustration. These are all photographs, by the way, right? So you see Gandhi right where? Again, in the middle of the frame. In the middle of the frame, once again, bare-chested. He's got the shawl around him, 
right? And he is clearly the center of attention. But there are a hundred people filling the frame, right? So it's the dialectic of the one and the many. So you've got the seated Gandhi, the standing Gandhi, the walking Gandhi, the individuated Gandhi. This is what I call the traveling Gandhi on train. The whole journey to be written there about Gandhi and his relationship with trains, some of which I have already pointed out to you uh, elements of that story uh, in previous lecture. This is what I call the framed Gandhi. These, by the way, are little clips from films that I, that I captured. Right? So this is from a very famous Hindi film. Uh, this actor is Shashi Kapoor, and there you see uh, a framed picture of Gandhi on the wall. Uh, but of course, when we speak about a framed picture, and you, there again, a different, a diff the same picture, but from a different angle, uh, and here a different film, uh, and you see the framed Gandhi there. Uh, I cannot tell you how many films. There must be thousands of films. I've certainly seen uh, a thousand films probably where I've seen framed representations of Gandhi on the wall. Right? But now we're going to have to try to be a little bit ironical about it. So this is what is called the framed Gandhi. But I want you to think about the word framed because one of the things, I hope if you read my piece, which, which was assigned to you for last week, the Gandhi everyone loves to hate. One of the things I argued there was there is a tendency in India to frame Gandhi for all of India's ills today. All right. So here I'm using frame now, of course, in a very different register. We frame him. Okay. Um, we frame him not only in this sense, but we hold him liable for our problems, culpable for our problems. Right. So you frame him because ah, oh, he's a friend of the capitalist. You frame him because he's somebody who was um, conservative in his views towards women, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Right? And here again, by the way, uh, you know, in the 19, you see the 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 framed portrait of Gandhi there in the background. In the 1950s, 1960s, if you re if you saw the Hindi film, you would invariably see a shot like this. This is a much later film. Okay, this is a much later film. This film is called Sir Farosh. Uh, but typically, what would you see? You'd see a police officer seated here and a picture of Gandhi there. And Gandhi is, of course, supposed to represent honesty, humility, the perfection, uh, toward striving towards God. And what is a police officer doing in the Hindi film? He's accepting a bribe. Almost invariably, that juxtaposition was going to be present. Right? He's accepting a bribe. And sometimes there would also be a slogan by Gandhi, honesty is the best policy, you know, honesty is the greatest virtue. And in that same frame, you see these police officers pocketing big bribes, all right, from businessmen or mafia people, whatever the case might be. Uh, so you see, even, even a popular filmmaker was toying with this idea of what it means to actually have a portrait of Gandhi up there on the wall, right? The comparable thing here would be that if you were to go to any government uh, office uh, or police station and you see, let's say, a framed picture of George Washington, one of the founding fathers, right? That would be the comparable thing. Um, you, do, you do know, of course, that lots of government offices uh, will, uh, will very often have a portrait of the sitting president of the United States. So if you go to some government offices, there'll be a portrait of Barack Obama. Once he's out of office, then you know, Trump, Trump uh, uh, or Hillary or whoever it is, it's going, to be, it's going to be up there on the wall. Right? But, but this was almost, in India, it was mandatory. Uh, almost uh, a, 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 every government office, every school would have this front frame portrait, father of the nation. And, and here um, you see uh, something very interesting. You see uh, the framed Gandhi. So we are still at the subject of the framed Gandhi. Here is a framed Gandhi over there. But this is a cartoon by a very famous cartoonist, R. K. Narayan, who used to do a, who used to do a cartoon called "You Said It Every Day." for, I don't know, something like 40 years, I think, uh, in one of India's major newspapers. And this man, he's, he's some kind of secretary to the minister. He picks up the phone uh, and says, he isn't here. He's referring to the minister. The minister is a, is a member of the cabinet. He's gone to attend a meeting at Santiago, Chile. So sorry, he isn't here either. So, you know, you can imagine the conversations of the guy says, well, can I speak to the other, you know, the deputy minister says, he's not here either. He left for Kyoto. 
But he is away too. This is the third person. He's in Budapest. All of India's ministers are busy traveling. Busy traveling, you know. Because frankly, India doesn't really have any problems. It doesn't have any poor people. So why do we really need, need to attend to the problems of India? Let's just go and have a little gig overseas, right? This is what the cartoonist. And this is all happening here, right? It's, it's almost like Gandhi is looking down upon all of these people, right? He's supposed to inspire them. Uh, make them dedicated servants to the nation. And what is the cartoon is doing? He's just showing the sheer hypocrisy of all of this. Right? And this is a wonderful uh, way in which you can begin to look at these images. And here you see a poster of Gandhi up there. This is a still from a film. I wrote a whole book on this film. The film is called Divar, a 1975 film where the coolie here, this is Amitabh Bachchan, India's most well-known actor for decades, uh, he is going to be inspired um, to fight the uh, the smuggling uh, ring, as it were, uh, at the docks um, before he himself becomes absorbed by it. Uh, and that's why you have the the framed poster of Gandhi. All right. Now, so thus far, few things we have done. We have said that okay, you can find these representations in prints, cartoons, sculptures, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Number one. Number two, that there are, that uh, we can think about different ways in which Gandhi is represented. So let's say you have to analytically organize your material, so you can think about the traveling Gandhi, standing Gandhi, individuated Gandhi, framed Gandhi, so forth and so on. There are many other Gandhis, the martyred Gandhi, the sartorial Gandhi, right? Uh, how one might construct an entire history of Gandhi just from how he is dressed or undressed. That would be a sartorial Gandhi. But now I want to move to a different dimension. I want to simply establish for you very quickly the fact that what you have here is you have a world historical figure right? whose representations appear in the most unusual places that you can think of. This is Gandhi with a Palestinian freedom fighter. Um, uh, this is from a popular image, you, uh, 2012. Uh, you see the Palestinian uh, flag in, in the background, 2012. And this man was a uh, hunger striker. Uh, and here you see a kind of a benign looking, in fact, Gandhi is looking quite cheerful. Then you have this heavily bearded man. Um, and yes, both of them are freedom fighters. But of course, uh, the Palestinian freedom fighters like him, Khader Adnan, they're not committed to nonviolence at all. Uh, Gandhi is. So the guy who's putting these two figures together is obviously making a political statement, saying that, well, notwithstanding the fact that Gandhi was committed to nonviolence and this man isn't, nonetheless, we should still view them as part of the global history of the struggle of the oppressed against the oppressor. Right? It, you could argue. But you could, of course, argue a great many other things. Is, is a Palestinian trying to understand how Gandhi's teachings might be deployed in the occupied territories? Right? So you see, there are multiple interpretations for each of these images. And I'm, again, I'm merely hinting at them to you. This is an image of Gandhi uh, on the separation wall. You know there's a separation wall, right, in the occupied territories. This is a huge graffiti that you see of Gandhi here, and then you see the soldiers there in, uh, in the foreground. Uh, this is a cartoon of Gandhi that appeared, uh, 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 again, a, quite a rare image. It appeared on February 12, 1948, uh, in the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, which used to be a major newspaper at that time, uh, uh, just a few days after Gandhi was assassinated. You recognize that other figure, of course, right? Lincoln. That's Lincoln. So here Gandhi has been linked with Lincoln. Both of them were martyred. Both, both of them, leaders of their country, assassinated. So the American journalist, cartoonist, this is what comes to mind when he hears about the assassination of Gandhi. And then he la labels this martyrs of humanity. Right? So this would, of course, raise a whole set of questions. How do we compare Lincoln and Gandhi? Right? Uh, are they really comparable figures? Do they occupy the same place in the history of the nation, uh, respectively? Right? So forth and so on. Um, this is now a mural. Uh, it's, uh, it's at the New School for Social Research in New York, uh, part of a series. by. Uh, this is a Mexican mural, muralist. 
Uh, and, and this mural was done during World War II. What you see over here is you see Gandhi on the right. There's Kasturba over there. Uh, and, and by the way, the, the, the muralist, you know, uh, gives a caption. So this is not the only mural. It's part of a series of murals. And it's basically a mural which is the struggle of the oppressed against the oppressor, right? Uh, the, the, the struggle to liberate yourself from militarism as well. Here you see these people, their hands are tied. You can see them. They're shackled. They're like slaves. And then you see the forces of militarism over here. Of course, it makes sense because this was done during World War II. And then you have on the right, you have Gandhi and Kasturba. Here, are, here, are, here, are the, here is this couple that has been waging a struggle. And what the, what the muralist is doing is showing two different modes of struggle. There's a struggle in India, and then there's a struggle in the continent, right? A struggle against, but what might be common in some ways is the struggle against militarism. That, that is in part the argument of this mural. So what are we trying to establish here? We're simply looking at the fact that, hey, you've got these images from such diverse contexts right, uh, of Gandhi. And of course, one could add thousands of such images that he had become an extraordinarily globalized figure. Here's an Indian magazine, uh, no longer published, the Illustrated Weekly of India puts uh, the commissar, that's Lenin, and then here you've got the Karma Yogi, you know, the great uh, uh, devotee of action. Um, Gandhi uh, puts them together, uh, and there you see the spinning wheel, and you, of course, for, for Gandhi, and then you see the icon by which communism is known. Now, when I say that Gandhi had become globalized, look at these, these are envelopes. Um, the, the, the envelope, so the letters sent to Gandhi, and some of the letters sent to him, the envelopes, see how he's being addressed. The beloved Indian deity, right? He's already been absorbed into the great canon of gods and goddesses. And you could say, well, that shows the apotheosis of Gandhi, right? He's been elevated to the rank of a god. You could also show he's been demoted because India has 330 million gods and goddess, goddesses, right? So again, there's a little twist that you can do on something like this. Uh, Mahatma Gandhi, dictator of Indian Union, right? He's not a dictator in the sense in which Adolf Hitler was a dictator. And in fact, Gandhi didn't occupy any office at all after the mid-1920s. But whoever wrote sent a Gandhi a letter and addressed the envelope in this fashion, right? Notice, by the way, no address. It just Mahatma Gandhi, dictator of Indian Union, New Delhi. And you just assume that it's going to reach its destination. Uh, after all, Gandhi doesn't need a P.O. box address, right? Uh, but the assumption that, yes, Gandhi is, in a sense, the unstated leader of the country. He may not occupy any position, but is it possible to get anything done until his signature is, so to speak, on the document? And here what I did was I just put together a little collage of some of these, uh, some of these uh, um, uh, uh, you know, envelopes that were, that were sent to him. Okay? Um, so th this is by way of establishing, as I said, the globalized nature of Gandhi. Now, what I want to do, I'm going to have to skip some images here. This is a very interesting one. Um, the section here has to do with uh, what I'm going to call down. So we move to the fourth major argument, and this, is, this has to do with the iconography of, Indi uh, of Gandhi. But before we do that, take a look at this particular print. Uh, this is one of those nationalist prints that I had started out with. Right? Here you have Gandhi who has been completely merged into the map of India. Right? So instead of seeing the top of India there, Kashmir and all of that, all you see is Gandhi's head there. This is the rest of this is India. This is the Penin Indian Peninsula. Right? Um, and um, th this, was, this, uh, this print came out just shortly after the assassination. Uh, what it tr is trying to establish is that Gandhi and India, in fact, are actually one. They are now indistinguishable, right? That henceforth, India's name will always be linked with Gandhi and vice versa. Now, we move to the iconography. What are the elements of the iconography? The pocket watch. This, this watch that he would always have, okay, attached to his dhoti. Dhoti was a loincloth that he wore. His glasses, right? 
very distinctive glasses. His ears, Mickey Mouse ears, as Sarojini Naidu once said. His walking stick. Look at this here. There's no figure of Gandhi here. Right? This is an advertisement, a half-page newspaper advertisement released by the Delhi government over here just a few years ago. So usually on Gandhi's birth day and his death anniversary, the newspapers, all the major newspapers, in whatever language they may be, they will have full-page ads or half-page ads brought out by some government division or the other celebrating the life of Gandhi or reminding us of his martyrdom. Uh, here it says, even time cannot forget. This is his pocket watch, okay? And if you actually just isolated it, I tell you that if you just had this, all right, and asked an Indian, what do you think of? Can you think of a figure? Immediately they'll say Gandhi, immediately. Be look at this one over here, right? This is a full, I, this is, uh, it's not like I've taken half the image here. This is a, a set of 100 postcards, uh, all of them designed by major Indian artists. Each of them was asked on a special occasion, you know, how would you represent Gandhi? Would you, in post, so the, the whole thing was called postcards for Gandhi, right? Postcards for Gandhi. And, and, and this is what the artist did. Look at the dhoti. Dhoti is a loincloth, and then you see the timepiece there. Right? Because this is the iconography. Now, Gandhi's, Gandhi's face is not shown, but anyone would recognize this for something that is standing in the place of Gandhi, reminding us of Gandhi. Right? And just, just to give you an indication of how he wore this, this timepiece, this is a photograph, and you see that timepiece right over there. It was tucked into his dhoti. Here, Gandhi is like a, if in a manner of a Buddhist uh, monk, he is begging for alms. He's actually collecting money for his constructive program. That's what he's doing over here, right? Uh, and look at this here. This is from the Confederation of Indian Industry, a brochure that they brought out. Uh, now, you immediately know that this is Gandhi. Of course, they, even, they have a little caption there, and, they, and it says in tribute to the Maha Atma, in tribute to the great soul. But supposing you didn't have this, right? You didn't have this, and you didn't have that, and you just had the image. This is part of that recognizable iconography. That, that bald head, those ears sticking out, right? This is what I mean by the iconography. Now, a quick set, a succession of images. So the walking stick. Look at this, the sandals, that's part of the iconography. The pet goat, you know, he had a pet goat, right? Um, and if you saw this, immediately an Indian would say yes. Much in the way in which, how do you recognize Krishna, the god Krishna, right? Because if you see a god playing a flute, the Indian who's looking at that immediately knows, ah, this is Krishna. If you, see, if you see a god with a trident or seated on, the, on a tiger skin, you know it's the god Shiva. Right? This is what I mean by the iconography. And I'm suggesting to you, Gandhi is the only figure who is not a religious teacher or who is not a god, a historical figure in India around whom a distinct iconography developed. Right? And so here you see the sandals, uh, the characteristic walk, uh, and, and this is part of the set of the, uh, part of that uh, postcards for Gandhi's set. Um, so here you see the spectacles, the spectacles, uh, the timepiece, the sandals, the book. Right? Uh, the, here's the walking stick on the right again. Uh, and now we come to statues. I want to spend a little bit of time on statues. And I'm going to suggest some things that will seem not self-evident to you at all. Everyone has walked by statues. If you live in a city, very often even in a small town, you will all, almost invariably have walked by a statue. But I also want to suggest to you that statues are invisible. Now let me try to explain what I mean by that. All right. So when I was uh, staying in London, I was there for about a year, year and a half when I was doing my doctoral research. 
London is a city of statues. And the reason they have so many, of course, is the British had an empire. So all the rogues and scoundrels are celebrated. The ones who conquered Africa, the ones who conquered India, right? They're all celebrated. Rhodes, Clive, you name it. Chock full. Particularly if you go to central London, it's just chock full of them. Right? And then, of course, you have some heroic figures, Florence Nightingale, uh, and then, of course, you've got Trafalgar Square. I'm sure a few of you here have been to London, and you know the Trafalgar Square is full of statues. It's not just Nelson's column, but even the statues around it, uh, including a statue of a man called Havelock, the man who, uh, who recovered India for the British uh, in 1857, 1858, when there was this huge rebellion. So what do people make of statues? And what I found when I was in London was that those were the days without iPhones. I'm talking about 1989, 1991, that's a period. And you know, if you had to find a place, you, had, you, you, you needed to have a map in your hands. Or you have the London A to Z guide, as it's called. Um, but you know, very often it's much easier to ask somebody, particularly if it's getting confusing. And typically this is how I would be given directions by most people. Walk down the street, there's a statue there, hang a right there, mate, and then go and walk for 100 meters and you'll get to another statue and take a left there, mate, and walk up and then you'll come to a third statue and then take a right and you're at your destination. Right? And then if you said, whose statue is this? No one seemed to know. So I conducted a little experiment. Many others have conducted experiments, but I wanted to conduct this experiment for myself. So there's a statue of... Gandhi, which you will see shortly, in Skokie. Skokie is in Illinois. It is about 25, 30 miles from downtown Chicago. Does anybody here know the significance of Skokie? Anyone? Yes? Well, okay. It is where the neo-Nazis every year stage a march every year the the neo-nazis and the u.s there they will stage a march there and you know why they do it in skokie because skokie has a very large jewish population mainly refugees okay of course from world war ii so this is again an attempt to intimidate them to establish right their supremacy the neo-nazis Every year they stage a march in Skokie. And I went to Skokie because they also have a statue of Gandhi there. And God knows they need a statue of Gandhi there, given that the neo-Nazis are, are you know, staging a march there here every year. <laughs> but here's the experiment. So, you know, the statue is, let's say here, then you have this divide, and, and then you have the road, and then you have houses there. So I knocked on a door. And somebody opened it up and said, excuse me, I just have a very brief question. Do you know whose statue that is right across your... I said, no idea, man, no idea. All right, then knock on the next door. So I, there were about four people out of ten who were present. Uh, each of the four, the statue is literally 20 feet away from them. All right? I mean, it's across them. Every time they open their front door, you're looking at the statue. Okay? None of them knew who the statue who was represented. All right? And somebody might say, well, you know, that just shows that, yeah, you know, ordinary Americans don't really care. I mean, you know, Gandhi, well, you're some bloke, you know, who went around half naked, you know, right? Uh, how does it really matter? No, this is not the point. The point is the sheer invisibility of statues. There's a wonderful German writer, Robert Musel, uh, and he wrote a piece uh, in, in a book published in the 1940s, uh, Posthumous Papers of a Living Author, uh, Robert Musil, and one of the, he has a little piece on monuments, and he says, nothing is as invisible as statues. And in fact, the bigger they are, the more invisible they are in some fashion. Right? And again, this is, seems completely contrary to common sense. Because why do people, why does a state put up statues? It puts up statues to remind you. Why do they put up statues of Lincoln 
or George Washington, right? Or Martin Luther King, right? To remind people of this person and his or her right achievements, heroic sacrifice, etc., etc., etc. That's what the purpose is. But in fact, I am suggesting to you that in many ways the statue actually has the impact of homogenizing memory, right? And this statue, so I begin my narrative with this one here. This woman is seated over there and she's actually making her living because she just brings a little stove and she cooks little meals and passes by, right, living hand to mouth. Uh, if you ask her whose statue it is under whom you've been sitting for 20 years, completely clueless. And it is not because she is illiterate, which she is. Right? Because remember, those people whose doors I knocked on in Skokie, they're not illiterate. Right? I don't know the, I, I didn't have an hour long conversation with each to establish how far they were educated, but let's assume that the vast majority of people in the United States have at least finished high school, the vast majority, right? Uh, this is typically what happens to these statues. Here's a very giant one outside the Bombay Secretariat. Um, the government of Bombay is run by Hin the Hindu right wing. They're not really very, ho they're not very uh, favorably inclined towards Gandhi. In fact, they have a hostile view towards Gandhi. But Gandhi is cultural capital, right? As, as I've tried to establish. Here's a statue of Gandhi in Washington, D.C. And there's a long story we told there because I don't know if you know that putting a statue of a foreigner in the inner circle of Washington, D.C. is not easy. It took over 20 years before this statue was approved because the inner portion of Washington, D.C. is reserved for the great American heroes. Right? And if you've been to Washington, you know exactly what I mean. You've got the Jefferson Memorial, the Washington Memorial, now you've got the King Memorial, etc., etc. Right? But, but they finally gave special permission for this statue to be installed. Uh, and it's right outside the embassy of India. That's, you, that's what you see there, the Chancery Building. And you see the flag of India over there. It, 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 I've taken the shots of these statues from different positions. And this is a statue here. Does anybody recognize this? Anyone here from the Bay Area? There. Okay, this is, this is at the ferry terminal in San Francisco, right? So I took this shot some years ago, and you'll see how you can, just how you position a shot. So this is Gandhi looking out to the sea, looking out to the sea. You know, this could be Porbandar. He was looking out to the sea. He had a relationship. He did all of these transatlantic voyages as well. But if you look at this next image here, so this again, you know, I took it from a certain, because I wanted to just try to suggest something. So here you've got Gandhi's walking stick. And then you got this skyscraper, right? So you get a verticality. Then you get this big clock here, and you get Gandhi's timepiece here, right? So what it does is it exaggerates the effect when you, when you photograph it in this particular fashion, right? Because you begin to see some of the elements of the iconography and how do, they, how, how do we interpret them in the light of today. Um, this is obviously not Gandhi, right? Quick three seconds. Anybody here? Recognize these two figures, bearded, benign, avuncular looking, Marx and Engels, a park in Shanghai. When I went there in 2007, now notice what's happening. It's become a badminton court, right? I sat there for half an hour and I was very careful to talk only to young Chinese because I figured that the older Chinese, many of them wouldn't know any English at all. That if I had any success in speaking to a person, it would be a young person because English is required, as you know, in, in Chinese schools. And I was able to have a conversation with about six or seven of them. My conversation was limited to the question, can you tell me whose statues these are here? Who are these two figures? None of them knew. So much for communism and China, all right? Here are the founding fathers, Marx and Engels, in this park, and no one knows. And here you have, this is not Gandhi again, because what am I doing here? I'm trying to suggest to you, how is it that one reads the history of statues, right? All statues, of course, have a, the same fate. In other words, pigeons come and sit on their head and drop shit, all right? That, 
every statue, whether you're Mohandas Gandhi, Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, or Adolf Hitler, this is your fate, right? Uh, and here you have a statue, I can't go into this whole history, this is an Indian revolutionary figure who went and assassinated a British uh, a colonial official in London. Um, and look at this, the statue has now been surrounded by all these vendors, right? They're going about their business. The statue has become invisible. It's there, it's staring at you, you're staring at it, and yet it has become invisible, right? And so this is how you do the cultural history of images and the materiality of that is very important as well. Here's a statue of Gandhi. Nearly, by the way, all these images are images that I've, that I've myself taken. Not this one though. Uh, this is from, this is from uh, the internet. Uh, here's a statue of Gandhi. So it says Mahatma Gandhi there. Uh, the fact that, it, that it, it's a statue of a key person is indicated by the fact that you have uh, two major political figures here. Uh, this is when the statue was inaugurated. This is Keith Vaz, uh, uh, and a person of Indian background who has lived in England his whole life, a uh, member of the Labour Party. Uh, this is the former Prime Minister of England, uh, okay, Gordon Brown. Uh, and this is what the statue, this is what the plaque says. Now, look at what the quotation is. We must become the change we want to see. And recall, there is no such quotation from Gandhi's writings, right? But it's in quote. And I mentioned to you that even though in fact Gandhi never exactly said this, we can imagine him saying this. That before you ask of something of someone else, as I've insisted repeatedly, you must ask that same thing of yourself. Before you make a demand upon someone else, make the demand upon yourself. We must become the change we want to see. Right? If we want the world to become more ecological, first we should become more ecological, right? Unveiled by His Holiness, then it gives you the little details. This is the one, this I had showed you before outside New Zealand. And again, the quotation. We must become, you know, now of course the change we want to see, now it's found in mugs and t-shirts and stickers and posters all over the world. Uh, there's a whole book waiting to be written just on that on how this one little quotation has traveled around the world in various ways. This is the statue of Gandhi in Skokie that I was referring to earlier, and all around it there are little, here we, here we go again. Uh, we must become the change we want to see, right? I love this one, right? This is a little variation. You must be the change you wish to see. A person who did it, this is in a park in Evanston, again in the Chicago area. Right? Uh, the person is saying, hey, you know, you change yourself first. Right? Not we. Look, the change of pronoun here is interesting. You must be the change you wish to see in the world. Right? But of course, you could refer to oneself, but uh, there could be a degree of self reflexivity here. And then Gandhi uh, it attributes it to Gandhi. Uh, and this one is from Botswana in Africa. You must be the wish. But the change you wish to see in the world, and here you've got a frowning Gandhi, right? Uh, quite atypical, but again it shows you uh, how someone in the popular imagination uh, is representing Gandhi. I'm going to, this slide show itself goes on for another 45 minutes, but I'm going to end with this one here. Um, uh, and I want to explain to you this last print that I want to, uh, that, that, uh, allows me to entertain a few other points. So this is one of those prints. However, this is a full biographical print. It's a full biographical print. You start reading the print from here. Reading mean interpreting, right? Gandhi in the cradle, right? Little boy grows up. You, so you go from the, the left bottom to the top uh, left hand side of the print, then you go across, right, roughly, and then you come down all the way over there on the right hand side, and these are assorted images here, and then you have Gandhi in the middle. It's a biography of Gandhi. If your Indian villager had to be given the biography of Gandhi, so what would you do? You'd hand out the print, it would circulate, and the storyteller, 
So there is, by the way, a whole tradition of storytelling, which uh, I cannot illustrate for the moment, but these are scrolls with panels. Right? So when you tell a story to villagers, you start at the top and then you keep on rolling down the scroll. Right? And each panel will tell one, each frame will tell one portion of the story. This is all done in one sing, single panel, so to speak. It ends with the assassination of Gandhi. These, this, this is blood, right? Here's blood. So this, you know, this is done after his assassination in 1948. Right? It's done in 1948. It simply says here, by the way, uh, Mahatma Gandhi Jivani. Jivani here means life story, literally. It is the life story of Gandhi. Okay? But this is also, by the way, an interesting illustration of what I have called the sartorial Gandhi. Sartorial meaning referring to clothes and how one is dressed. Right? So here you go, here he is in the cradle, then he's wearing his, you know, the native dress. Now you, you can imagine what this is, right? These two here on the left, this is him becoming anglicized. Remember, he goes to London. I, I think I remarked to you that Gandhi is the only person in history I can think of who, who started his adult life vastly overdressed and ended it vastly underdressed. Right? And you can track his biography through the sartorial changes. What did he wear at a particular point in time? So there on the top left, he's become the Satyagrahi, the Satyagrahi in South Africa. Then the image next to that, that's him and Kasturba. This is, they've come back to India, right? They've come back to India. He's wearing the, 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 the turban, the traditional turban of a Katyavari person. Uh, Kasturba is next to him and now he has over here this is now we, this is the transformation beginning with this half of the print beginning from here right the transformation of the gun in, 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 into the person that that became the most uh, iconic figure as I said in Indian history and here he is on the march right on the salt march this is his meeting with the if you look at the cursor here, this is his meeting with the king emperor. Uh, typical representation of him spinning at his ashram, addressing large crowds over here. This is Gandhi with Nehru. Uh, and, and over here, you're going to see uh, Gandhi with a child. And uh, you're going to, that's Mahadev Desai there, his secretary. And this is Gandhi with uh, Manu and Abba. And then, of course, this is Birla House here. In the background here, you just see the little bit over there. And then you see the, the martyred, Gandhi, right? The, almost with the stigmata, right? So if you've seen representations of Christ, you know, you see the stigmata, right? Uh, and, and this is uh, how this print actually works. All right, we're going to conclude this. The, as I said, there are, you know, there's a great many more prints. Uh, this, by the way, just as an illustration, this is a very famous Indian artist, Bhupen Kakkar, uh, a man with the flowers. And uh, this is a modern day artist whose who's, uh, uh, who's, uh, work sells for you know, half a million, one million, two million dollars, um, used exactly the same framing device. You start over here, you, right? Go on to the top, to the right, and then come down. Um, so these, one can write about these prints in various kinds of ways. All right, let me, let me uh, turn on the lights and move on to um, the, okay. Okay, so what I want to do now is, uh, you know, we had finished the last segment uh, with the critics of Gandhi. The critics of Gandhi, Gandhi's relationship uh, with uh, uh, Ambedkar, uh, with uh, uh, Tagore, right? Uh, and had generally looked at, you know, what kinds of uh, um, impressions Gandhi had left upon people, how did he gather together a circle of friends, people who fo followed him in various respects, uh, all of those things, right? That's, that's what we had really looked at. But what I'm interested in doing now is I'm interested in turning to uh, this next segment here, uh, which brings us really to the conclusion of the course this week and next week, and that is a segment which has to do with um, uh, Gandhi's assassination, uh, the history of India from uh, uh, the 1940s, uh, and... Uh, from there, moving on to Gandhi's 
you know, representations in modern Indian life, uh, the impact he may or may not have uh, 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 left behind uh, when we look at modern day India. Uh, those are the kinds of considerations I'm interested in. And I'm also interested more broadly in what we might call uh, Gandhi's relationship to the, to the modern world. All right. So what I want to start with is this, because many of you are not really familiar with the political history. And we're going to have to go through this very, very rapidly, uh, because our interest here is not really uh, trying to understand why the partition of India took place. Uh, what we're interested in, rather, is trying to locate Gandhi uh, in the last 15 years of his life uh, and then trying to understand the circumstances that led to the assassination of Gandhi on January 30th. So recall that we had been talking about, uh, as far as the political history goes, we'd been talking about the Salt March, we are talking about the Roundtable Conference, uh, and the fact that the British had finally started to negotiate with the Indian National Congress and with other Indians for the future of India, for the independence of India. Right? Now, one of the things I have not spoken to you about is at any length, I've, I've mentioned it, but we want to spend just a minute or two on the problem of communalism. All right? Now, when I say communalism, what I'm referring to is this idea that Hindus and Muslims in India constitute monolithic blocks. That if you're a Hindu, you have an affinity to all other Hindus. If you're a Muslim, you have an affinity to all other Muslims. Right? So the communalist view of Indian history, uh, this, these uh, markers are not very good, but just writing the word down here, communalism, right? So the communal interpretation of Indian history takes the following trajectory. If you look at any individual, I think you will agree with the proposition that a person can be known in various ways. A person has multiple identities. And so a person could be, take myself, and you'd say, all right, the person, you know, here's an Indian. Possibly an American, possibly an Indian American, that might be another way. Male, right? Then, then you could add, so let's suppose in my sexual orientation was heterosexual, straight, you could add that to my identity. Then you could add my profession to my identity, so forth and so on. Identity, however, is not stable. It is not stable. The only thing that might appear to give it some stability are what you might describe as the inherited characteristics of that identity. Even that is questionable. But let me put it to you simply in this fashion so that you can understand communalism because we don't have the luxury of trying to undertake a whole analysis here of exactly what this ideology of communalism really meant. What is germane for our purposes is the fact that the British were inclined to the view, very strongly inclined to the view, that before an Indian is anything else, before Vinay Lal is a professor, before he's a male, before he's an Indian American, he is a Hindu. He is marked by his religion. Everyone in India is marked by his or her religion before they are marked by anything else. And eventually this is going to lead to the view that all Hindus, upper class Hindus, lower class Hindus, low caste, upper caste, middle class, it doesn't matter. They are not going to be interested in questions of class solidarity. A Hindu will always first and foremost think as a Hindu. A Muslim will first and foremost think as a Muslim. And then you become part of a monolithic block called Hindus and Muslims. And according to the British view, Hindus and Muslims were bound to be in conflict with each other because these were two religions, Hinduism and Islam, which had nothing in common with each other. I have very often used this kind of uh, representation in my courses and I'll use it here again. 
that if you had to summarize the British view of the difference between a Hindu and a Muslim, the view was the Hindu worships the cow, venerates the cow. The Muslim loves to eat the cow. Right? This is the irreducible difference from the colonial point of view between the Hindu and the Muslim. And so there's logically what this meant was that Hindus and Muslims would now be in conflict with each other, particularly when independence is on the horizon. Because then you have Muslims who are going to say, ah, if India becomes independent, will it become a Hindu India? What was a population of Hindus in undivided India before the partition? Right? Something in the neighborhood of, let's say, you know, 72, 73%, certainly 70%. Muslims are 25, 26% of the population of undivided India. So the Muslim view encouraged by the British, because this was not the view that the Muslims had in 1900 or in 1910 or 1920 or even 1930. But as we move along in time, independence is on the horizon. The British are going to say, yeah, you know, we're prepared to quit India, but we can't leave it behind like this. Because if we leave it behind, there's going to be Hindu domination over here. As though the British were not exercising their own domination, right? This is the whole idea that, well, we transcend all these differences. We, you know, we, you know we, have, we have no inherent stakes in India. We're just trying to govern India for the sake of Indians. So this is what is going to lead to the rift eventually between Hindus and Muslims. And one of the things that's going to happen is that when World War II breaks out in 1939, the Congress is going to argue for neutrality. I have mentioned that before. Uh, it's going to argue for neutrality because, very briefly put, Gandhi and the Congress are going to say, we're not going to distinguish between fascists and imperialists. Uh, yeah, we know the Nazis and uh, the fascists in Italy are no good, but why should we assume that the imperialists are any better? Right? After all, they've bled much of the world already, including India. So I'm putting it to you in a nutshell. This is going to be the position. The Congress is going to adopt officially a position of neutrality during World War II. Even though the British government is going to, of course, try to recruit Indians, which they do, to fight during the war. And India did play a significant role in the war, as is increasingly being brought out by recent scholarship. However, the Muslim League, which was a major political party representing the Muslims, decided that it would aid the British war effort. And during this time, 1942 to 1944, right, there you have what is called the Quit India Movement. So Gandhi, this is, Gandhi is going to issue one last call for resistance to the British. It's called the Quit India Movement. As soon as he issues this call, he's going to be imprisoned. The entire Congress leadership is going to be imprisoned. They're going to be in jail for, from 1942 to 44, for four years, for two years. Right? And during this period of time, the Muslim League begins to flourish. Because the Muslim League leaders right, had decided to support. And they were led by a man called Muhammad Ali Jinnah. So if you look at 1945 to 47, uh, you see his name over there, Muhammad Ali Jinnah. There has already been in 1942, the, what is called the Pakistan Resolution. The Muslim League in 1940 finally passed a resolution saying that the interests of the Muslims of India would be best served if a new country were created, which would be a country for Muslims called Pakistan. Right? So those are the circumstances. 1945 to 1947, you're going to have complex set of negotiations. Because recall, 44, 45, the war in Europe ends in 44. The war in the Pacific theater ends 1945 with, of course, the atomic bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Right? And, and you've got the end of World War II. The Congress leadership has already been released. Britain knows that the writing is on the wall. That, in other words, that Britain is going to have to quit India. And it, this is what sets the stage for the negotiations for Indian independence. When I say negotiations, what are they negotiating about? They're negotiating about, for example, what shall be the status of Muslims in India. Now, if you have the Muslim League saying that, well, we're not really interested anymore even negotiating the status of Muslims in India because we want a separate country for ourselves, right? We want a separate country for ourselves. 
But here are some difficulties. Let me give you, let me give you an illustration of one difficulty. Let me show you a map over here. Because think of it this way. If, for example, let, just hypothetically, let's say that Texas was a Muslim state. Right? Let's say that the population was comprised predominantly of Muslims, 90%. And Texans, Muslims said, hey, we want to secede from the Union. Right? So you say, hey, okay, well, it's feasible because the vast bulk of Muslims living in the United States are living in this one state called Texas. So Texas is carved out as a separate country. And yes, there are pockets of Muslims here and there. You know, there's a Muslim population in Los Angeles. There's a Muslim population in Detroit. Detroit has a big population, right, of Arabs. And there are these pockets, but all told, you're still talking about, all right, a few million people. Three million people, maybe five million, outside that 90% of Muslims living in Texas in this imaginary scenario. Right? So you could say that, well, we carve it out. However, in India, the problem is different. One reason it's different is you're talking about a huge population of Muslims. And you're talking about Muslims who are scattered all over the country. All over the country. Let's take a illust look, let's look at this over here. And there's a second set of problems that we'd have to consider if we were doing a course on the partition or the contemporary history of South Asia. It doesn't really concern us very much for the moment. And that is a fact that even before 1947, one third of the country. So if you look at this map over here, one third of the country is technically not under direct British rule. Right? You had all of these native states. Gandhi had come from one such state. I know that you have to now go back to the first week and the early part of the second week where I talked to you about these native states. So what is going to happen to these native states? And if there are over 500 of them, they're not all going to become independent nations. You're not going to get 500 countries carved out of this chunk called South Asia. But going back to the Muslim issue, the first set of issues that we're interested in here. So if you look at this map here, you look at Hyderabad. This is a native state. However, it is a pre it is in portions, not all of Hyderabad. The city of Hyderabad. So Hyderabad here refers both to the state state and the city of Hyderabad, the city had a Muslim majority, large city. If you, if you look over here, this Gangetic Plains over here, right, Delhi, huge, huge Muslim population in Delhi, old Delhi. Right? You go to almost any city over here in this entire area, you would find significant Muslims. Now, what was the demand for the creation of Pakistan? The demand was you had a very substantial number of Muslims in two areas of the country. And when I say substantial here, I'm talking about tens of billions. I'm not talking about three million or five million. All right. What are these two areas? One, Western India, the Punjab here. Okay, the Punjab. And of course, if you go further west, this is going to become, pre this is going to be predominantly Muslim, this whole area over here. This is the map of India before the partition. This is what undivided India looked like. And you have a very substantial portion of Muslims over here in eastern Bengal, in eastern Bengal. So if you want to create a separate state for Muslims, how are you going to do it? Is it going to be over here or is it going to be over here? And if it's going to be either of the two, what about the huge number of Muslims living here? What about the huge number of Muslims living over here? What about the huge number of Muslims living in Ahmedabad, the city that Gandhi himself had a long association with where he had the Sabarmati Ashram? Not to mention the fact that most Indian villages had substantial numbers of Hindus and Muslims all over the country. What are you going to do? Right? So this is going to be the conundrum, if I may put it this way, 
that everyone is going to have to think through. And to unravel this, you're going to have to come back on Thursday. All right? Uh, to see exactly what was the shape of things. Uh, because this is the backdrop to the assassination of Gandhi and the ideology of the assassin. All right?